idea of DNA sequencing is really quite interesting. Let's take a look at this little example here. So here we're looking at the cave bear, and uh, we, you know, want to know a little bit about the, a little bit about its DNA or maybe possible contents of its intestines. And what we will see is that, you know, if we were just to take a look at, you know, bear's DNA, we won't exactly know for sure which DNA we're looking at. So in a lot of forensic studies, what they do, they don't necessarily have the entire bear. So they take a little bit of what they can uh, get their hands on and, you know, usually tooth extraction seems to be a really sort of good place to get started with. So they extract a little bit of its DNA, they put it through high throughput DNA sequencing, complicated process, which is what I will tell you about in this video. They analyze the data because that allows us to actually sort of first of all decipher whether it's bear's DNA or not or what does that actually tell us. And the process which they use is really quite interesting. It was, um, <clears throat> it basically is reduced to taking the DNA double helix and taking it apart, uh, breaking it into smaller fragments and actually creating newer fragments, uh, all different sizes, all fluorescently labeled. And you can see little colored representations right here. You all probably know the DNA is made of four individual subunits called nucleotides, guanine, thymine, adenine, and cytosine. And the point is that if you fluoresce, fluorescently label those nucleotides and you create different size fragments, A, you can separate those different size fragments based on size with a technique called gel electrophoresis or electrophoresis. And B, you can also add an extra dimension to where you irradiate those fluorescently labeled molecules with a laser. And as the fluorescence is given off, you can actually tell what, uh, based on the wavelength of the fluorescence, you can actually tell what the DNA sequence originally was. So in this video today, I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, what do we actually do with those sequencing products? How do we actually clean them up and prepare them for this kind of analysis? So <clears throat> here's our samples that we're taking out of the thermocycler. This is our complete DNA sequencing uh, products, but they have not been purified yet. Uh, we will first start with addition of 70% isopropanol, which is required to ensure precipitation of the DNA to the bottoms of the wells. We need to do it very accurately, recap the samples, mix them up a little bit with the isopropanol, and the key step here is to actually separate the samples as they're purifying from the isopropanol. And of course we're going to do this using the centrifugation technique after which we shall tap out our alcohol. Next step is addition of 70% ethanol, which will remove all the other smaller impurities, which are still left over. Spin them for another 15 minutes in the centrifuge, which will of course allow us to clean it up even further. Now next step is the drying technique, where our samples are inverted onto a paper towel and once again centrifugated to remove whatever potential isopropanol is left over, hoping that our DNA fragments are left in those tubes. Now, it's important to denature our DNA. That's why we add deionized formamide, which will allow us to split our DNA fragments from each other, so to enable the proper separation further down the line. Next key step is to making sure that our samples are actually matched with our original plate, which we will transfer onto a sample sheet, which will ensure the proper tracking of the samples as they are running through the sequencer. As we've completed all those steps, we will place now our plate with our purified samples with deionized formamide into the plate that will go into the sequencer itself. We add a septa that will prevent the spillover of samples. We'll add an extra brace that will ensure that our samples stay contained to um, their tubes and then we're going to place the plate into the sequencer and it has to be done right. You see it's not going to go in the wrong way and uh, here's the proper placement. We're going to latch it into its holder and <clears throat> let's take a quick look at what the sequencer is all really about. Now what we have behind it, what we have behind this door is our polymer array. You see those fine little needles. These are injection needles. Where, that's where our samples are going to be taken up. There are samples that will then travel through those fine tubes called the capillaries. 
Uh, and then until they get to the little window where they will be irradiated by a powerful laser and the fluorescence given off, detected and recorded. Now the rest of the assembly is a polymer pump which fills up the capillaries with the polymer. Here's our polymer source right there, $150 a pop. And of course we have a buffer chamber which completes the electrophoretic circuit. There's another electrode in there and you can see the circuit right there. Second electrode is the needles themselves. So our sequencer is really quite an advanced machine. You can see that as soon as we put the samples in, the machine is going to auto calibrate, put itself in the right place, right there, put itself in the buffer chamber. And our next step is of course initiating the run. But to do that, we still need to find our sample sheet that we've created earlier. It has to be a right sample sheet because we need to make sure that each data <coughs> data sample is actually correlated with the proper sample name. And here it is. This is our sample sheet. We're going to link it to our plate, which we know is linked because it turned green. And we are starting our run. Now, the key here is to make sure everything is done right, all the sample names were given properly, and because once we leave this thing alone, it's going to run its course for a few hours. Uh, normally we have eight sets of 16, so eight hours is what, how long it takes to run 100 samples. Let's take a look at this. This is an example of our final data output. Um, we need to analyze it, and to analyze this, we have a number of tools available to us. One of them is what's called a BLAST algorithm, um, which will link our data, our sequencing, newly generated sequencing data, see the set of letters, to the large databases created by the NIH. So here's our sequence that we have gotten off of our sequencer, right there. Let's go on ahead and click the BLAST button, which will um, send the data to the NIH and Bethesda. And here's our list of matches. First one is Pseudomonas. Uh, and you can see that a few others match as well. Let's take a look at how well it's actually matched. Well, there's our DNA sequence that we have produced from these samples and the query data and the database entry. And the match is really quite high and it matches with this organism. Now, in this particular example, good to see what this organism is so we can very conveniently highlight the name and very conveniently copy and paste that name into our Google search window let's see what it comes up with and we hit enter and there's of course the very first entry is the Wikipedia entry which tells us what Pseudomonas is so there it is we've just sequenced Pseudomonas which is a bacteria which can cause disease in animals including humans uh, I know.